Hey, it's Andrew, and I am finally, after a while, sitting down to make this YouTube video. Uh, I apologize for the absence of videos, those of you who are actually looking forward to more. Um, the, this, this year so far has been incredibly busy for me, which is great as a film composer, because that means I've had lots of great musical opportunities. And this is one of them, actually. This is for my friend Sam Wickert. Uh, this is my score for... Chalk Warfare 3. <clears throat> I scored number 2 as well. I guess a little over a year ago at this point. Don't remember exactly when. And I enjoy writing for Sam. Um, anyways, this video will not necessarily be about how my music correlates to the on-screen action, but it will be more about uh, percussion and the role percussion plays and how you can uh, approach a piece from a more percussive standpoint and achieve a connection between the percussive lines and the more orchestral, melodic, harmonic, what have you lines. So <clears throat> I will post a link to the original video in the description. Likewise, I will post a link to this piece on my SoundCloud where you can hear just the music without the video. I suggest you listen to that before we get started. I'm not going to play the whole thing start to finish in this video, but I am going to play sections in isolation so you are able to or just to really illustrate points as I go. So we'll jump right into that. First off, one of the big concepts that everyone needs to get when they sit down to compose for film, especially like in computer music, that's what this is, is you are first and foremost a synthesis. You are working with synths. No matter how organic or how realistic your samples sound, you are manipulating uh, someone else's sounds. You, you are not the creator of those sounds necessarily. So as such, you have to think of writing um, computer music as being an orchestrator. The best orchestrators in the world are able to create and capture amazing sounds out of instruments that everybody has access to. Uh, you know, everybody plays with the same more or less standard orchestral instruments but you can tell a experienced and amazing orchestrator from an inexperienced average orchestrator just almost instantly on listening how they work the orchestra. And so you have to do the same thing with your samples. Everybody kind of has a different sample pool that they pull from, so nobody's gonna sound the same. But I guarantee you, if you are just making your music sound realistic, while that is a great thing to do with samples, if that's your only goal, and you're just replicating what an orchestra would normally do, um, people would rather listen to a real orchestra than to your samples. So get out of your mind that you are just writing for the orchestra. Uh, this is why I don't use templates. Uh, at least 98% of the time I don't use templates. I kind of build one instrument at a time, and I find and kind of mold sounds as, as I hear them or as I think they need to uh, be utilized. <clears throat> your, your goal should be to create something unique, something that stands out, and something that gets people's attention. And that could be any number of things. Um, and again, all in the context of working with the film that you are uh, scoring. Again, you don't want to, you don't want the music to stand out above the film as they are side by side but you want to enhance what's on screen. And if, this, if the film itself has a unique look to it or unique flavor or something unique and poignant about the plot, your music needs to color those sort of, uh, those sort of on-screen actions. Um, just a quick example of that is this, is, this is one of a lot of different things I did in the piece. But this particular plugin here, this in my miscellaneous section, which is kind of either choir, synth, piano, a couple different things. Uh, this is a free sample I got actually from Waves Factory. This is the 1850 pipe organ. <clears throat> um, all the different stops here are, they don't work. So basically it is, what, it is what it is and you can't really edit it very much. But it's a very dirty, dark, oppressive sound. Uh, it, 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 stands, it goes way beyond what I've ever heard in terms of an organ. Um, and I kind of color that in and out throughout the piece in specific sections. 
and that's just one example. Even that by itself isn't necessarily being unique, but once you blend it, I loved the sound of these instruments being blended together. Um, let me play it for you and you'll hear what I mean. It's kind of a dark, creepy, twisted sound. The organ itself is dark, the choir drone itself is a little dark, and this horn cluster here um, is a little dark. But once you put them together, suddenly you've molded and created a new soundscape that people either go, wow, I haven't heard that before, or as you bring it back throughout the piece, people go, okay, that sounds familiar. So that is a way of creating um, content that ties all your piece uh, all the pieces of your music together that's not necessarily melodic harmonic or motivic it's textural it's color and um, it alone is, is another way of developing um, you know returning material now when we talk about percussion in the context of um, short film or really just film in general and but specifically this kind of action short that Chalk Warfare 3 is, um, very often because of the fast changes in the film itself, your music will lend itself to rhythmic and percussive interest. And that's exactly what I, I saw when I watched the film for the first time. I said, okay, there's a lot of changes, a lot of direct hits there's a lot of people actually physically being hit by objects you know it, it just felt and looked very percussive almost metallic um, so oftentimes percussion may be even if you have a dense orchestral texture but if you have that percussion in there that may be the only thing that the audience latches onto, like psychologically because they see like I said they, they see a lot of hits and things on screen and so they're gonna latch onto that musically um, and so when I started sketching out the skeleton of the scenes, I would find my tempo and I would start creating these percussive textures and I would line it up so it's like, okay, so eight bars later, or however much, yeah, eight bars, this line right here represents a change. And at, at tempo 109, these eight, these eight bars here fell. So I would create kind of small loops and there would be a few differences, but you can see where I kind of copied and pasted the different sections. And that was the skeleton upon which I built the rest of the orchestral textures. I did, m most of the time, I wrote the percussion out first. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, it doesn't lend itself to the most delicate or intricate music, but it certainly gets the job done when it comes to scoring, because your job is not to write delicate or intricate music, your job is to score a film. And sometimes there are easier ways to do things. So like I said, the audience is probably going to hear the percussion more than any complicated orchestral textures. And if you were to isolate these tracks, I, I'm a little embarrassed. Like I went back to listen to a couple of the parts like, oh, I wonder what just the orchestra sounds like. It's very sloppy. Uh, it is not something I'm proud of, just the orchestral sequencing. But once you add the percussion over it, the interplay between the parts gives it a, a very nice sound and you don't notice the uh, imperfections and the quote mistakes in the other parts. Um, yes, so complexity, speaking of which, can be distracting. And you need to think of in your percussive parts, you need to think what's in the foreground and what's in the background. There's always going to be a part in the percussive section, usually the lower parts, but not always. Um, the part that is more felt and perceived, and then the part that is directly heard that our ears lock onto. Anything really fast or really complex, our ears are gonna hear but not really process. Um, if it's more droning, like I have a lot of a lot of sixteenth running sixteenth notes, uh, people will fall into those sort of patterns more easily. But you, of course, you're not limited. You're never limited by what you can do. But just keep in mind that any complexity you add may be lost, especially when they're watching the film and hearing the music. If they're listening to the music by itself, complexity is, you know, is fine, but just, just remember that a lot of things will be lost. So don't clutter your mix too much by having all your parts being really complex. Even the best orchestrations in the world 
the complexity is the sum total of the parts. It is not necessarily the complexity of any one part. Um, a lot of contemporary modern music is, is very complicated, very dense, but let's be honest, not everybody can really listen to that music and, and in one in one pass on the music really understand everything that's going on. So So keep it simple. Don't get too locked down in details and don't clutter your mix with complexity because your listeners aren't even going to hear it anyways. Uh, in terms of approaching the writing, I, as I said, I sketched out a lot of these uh, the percussive parts. It's a blend of synth, it's a blend of or organic orchestral percussion. And because I had a lot of the running 16ths, let me, let me play you this percussion part so you can get an idea. And that goes on and on uh, for at least those eight measures. Upon getting into that groove and realizing, okay, this really fits what's going on on screen, at least I think it did, um, I said, what can the orchestra be doing uh, that blends with that? I said, well, if I have percussive textures that stand out so much in terms of the score, why don't I have the orchestral parts also doing similar and like like-minded percussive percussive textures and that's exactly what i did it's basically the melodic and harmonic content of the orchestra of the orchestra orchestral parts was mimicking the percussion section and it sounds sort of like this So the harmony of these kind of long suspended chords is the, the rhythm of those chords was defined by how I sequenced the percussion. Uh, that's just how it ended up. It could be done any number of ways. Some, some notes are sustained. If you think about it, ostinatos are a type of sustain. Uh, it's a repetition of notes that to our ears, we hear the rhythm, but we also think of it as a sustain. It's like almost like a pedal tone. Um, so I have some notes sustaining and some notes playing fast staccato notes. So in terms of actually sequencing and recording your percussion, uh, I would suggest, highly suggest, that you quantize all of your percussion. And here's why. Percussion serves as the rhythmic backbone of the piece. And when you break out of predictable patterns, that unpredictability creates um, it creates a change of uh, kind of an excitement in the audience, and they immediately recognize it and go, "Okay, what you know, what's going on? What do I need to be on the lookout for?" This is all psychological, of course. There's no <laughs> there's no inner monologue. It's just very spur of the moment, very very quick. And so, the more predictable your percussion is, the more tight it is, the more reliable it is the more impactful the changes are. Um, secondly, it's just easier to program in a lot of ways. And everyone's different, but just, just for me, the, the, the programming is so much easier when things are quantized. Some people have told me, you know, it's like, well, then if you quantize everything, then you're gonna end up with kind of a, a fake sound, an artificial sound, um, <clears throat> almost the machine gun effect sometimes. And I, I beg to differ. Um, and here's why. Every sample, just like in real life orchestra, if the conductor brings his hand down for beat one and he wants everybody to come in and play something, every musician is good enough that they are going to get very close to the beat and the audience is going to hear everybody coming in more or less together. Samples are the same way. When we, when we use samples, we are triggering audio files, pre-recorded performances these wave files, and every wave file has a unique speak, uh, speaking time. Uh, let me show you what that is. If I take this bass drum, bounce in place, and we're gonna look at the wave file. Uh, okay. This MIDI, the MIDI for this is quantized exactly to beat one. Okay, no mystery there. 
But look at the WAV file itself. In terms of how it was programmed and recorded and cut, whatever, even though the WAV file starts here, or sorry, the MIDI file starts exactly here, it isn't until about here where we see the WAV file at its highest, which the initial sound happens here, but doesn't really grow, because there's always kind of a grow point. It takes a while for the sound to fully get inside the microphone head. Um, you know, sound travels. And every single sample is slightly different. So any extra quantizing, or anytime you, if you have distance from the, the MIDI and all the, the MIDI is slightly different, you're just going to accentuate something that's already there, something that's always already natural, something that really happens without thinking in live uh, orchestral music. So I, I'm just, I'm an advocate of quantizing everything and then tweaking as needed from there. Uh, something that helps remove the, the feeling of artificialness when you're quantizing everything uh, is messing with the tempo grid. Uh, if you go under tracks, global tracks, show tempo track, you'll see I have a lot of different tempo marks here. This is to create movement, to create a little motion. I mean, it's more or less the same for a good 50 measures. But once this starts happening, you really notice a, uh, um, a retardando and you know all the different changes. So that, that can help break up the monotony, even if you do quantize. Also, Logic Pro has a function where you can highlight a bunch of MIDI fields. Um, and under Function, MIDI Transform, if you click Humanize, uh, this randomizes the velocity, some of the duration, and some of the note starts uh, of different notes. So it basically, very subtly, and you can change the parameters and whatnot, but really if, oftentimes if you just select something, you know, select and operate, not just operate only, but like select and operate, it'll take everything down and under here and move it all minusculely, and it adds a little bit of a human element to it. So if you quantize everything, add a little bit of humanize, and mess with the tempo, you've completely eliminated any sense of artificiality in terms of note start and end points. Uh, so again, I, I think you should be quantizing percussion just to give your audience something to work with. Your orchestra, or whatever you have on top of the percussion, can be an absolute mess. But really, because the percussion stands out and is the bed, um, you're only really adding to realism if you have solid percussion and then slightly sloppy orchestra, which is really what this piece is. <laughs> the orchestra is pretty pretty sloppy in isolation, but between the orchestra and the percussion working together, it creates a nice sound. So finally, the last kind of basic important thing to remember, when you're programming percussion, like any section of the orchestra really when this is more about voicing and spacing than anything else but specifically with percussion you need to remember that there needs to be a foreground a midground and a background not everything can be not not everything can fill one of those sonic spaces uh, our ears are really listening for maybe one or two things and the rest just fills in and supports whatever's in the foreground so for example, this, this little section I'm gonna play you here, um, I have emphasis on the one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, where one is louder than the three. And then I have some rhythmic color building up to and accentuating the one, and the, accentuating the space between the one and the three, but really, ultimately in the foreground we have the anvil and some kind of synth drum that I have and then I have some toms kind of in the mid-ground, and then I have lower hits and kind of a droning 16th bassy sound, um, lowering it, or bringing in the, the background. It's kind of on the lower end. So remember, the higher the frequency, the more it's going to stick out in the foreground. So you have to be careful what sort of instruments you have playing mid and background uh, material. And it's really up to taste and really just kind of what your experience is with percussion or with the sample library in general. So I'm gonna go ahead and play this. There's nothing special about this at all, uh, but it, it just kind of accentuates. So when you listen to it, listen for what's in the front, listen to what's in the back, and listen to where your ears are drawn.
And, you know, that goes on in a similar fashion. Uh, let's see. Here's another section where there's a clear foreground, uh, background. And again, nothing special, but just listen to where your ears are drawn. And then I will play it with the orchestra and listen to how the or orchestra goes with what's going on. So every single section and every single part, you can break it down between percussion and non-percussion. You can break it up between winds, brass, strings, all the different elements. Everything has a foreground, everything has a background. And then together, those individual foregrounds, backgrounds need to uh, interact with uh, the other one so that there's always something. Regardless of what's the foreground in the percussion, uh, whatever the foreground is in the entire piece is needs to be the important thing. And again, it just comes with kind of experimenting and it just experience overall <clears throat> with the sample libraries or with whatever um, techniques you happen to use when you're writing your music. So. So that kind of had a uh, little bit of a lilted, kind of um, tripleted sound to it. Had a little bit of a swing. And the orchestra plays into that swinged pattern as well. Um, again, there's a sustained chord, but there's also rhythmic activity in different parts. Uh, so listen to what it all sounds like together. Again, just distinguishing in your mind what needs to be in the front, what needs to be in the back, and then orchestrating it based on that is so crucial to not crowding up your space or even getting bogged down in like, okay, I need my orchestration to be more dense or I need it to be, just don't think of it that way. Think of, I really only have like three or four different elements going on, but it's all just in different sections. It's doubled. It's, it's broken up it's slightly different in each section but really there's only a few musical ideas going on there but it still gets a big nice full sound out of it so one last final thing i want to talk about is when you're dealing with percussion you're probably going to have a lot of big low frequencies building up um, those are going to kill you they're going to kill your dynamics they're going to kill your mix once you try and kind of give your overall track some extra volume uh, if you mix your music yourself don't do any of the mixing except for a little volume balancing. Just don't start with any of that while you're sequencing. Get the sequencing out, get it down, get it tight, get it clean, and then um, you know, give it a couple days where you just kind of almost don't even listen to it again. Uh, deadlines don't always allow for this, but you, you know what I mean. Give it a couple days just to let it kind of sit in your ears and figure out what is getting too heavy, what, what frequencies are building up where. And just, just remember that if you have a bunch of low frequencies, I, I only have, let's see, I have a bass drum, which has nice low frequency. I have these rumbles, which I only use occasionally to color a few things. Um, I have some low hits in my Armageddon kit from uh, Damage, from, uh, from Complete, yeah, Damage. And I have a couple synth tracks with low kind of more bass than percussion, but it's definitely percussive. I try to avoid a lot of low frequencies just because they aren't going to be heard. They're going to be felt. Um, so keep that in mind. Uh, just It's almost like a pre-mix of sorts as you're sequencing. Just think of the overall mix and what you're going for. But those low frequencies and that buildup will just kill any sound. It'll just get too, too much, too big. Um, if you don't mix your own music, do the same thing. <laughs> Make it easy on your engineer by not just flooding your music with a bunch of low frequencies and then expect them to know what to do with them, where you want them. 
So the more obvious you are, like I was talking about foreground and background, the more obvious you are about what's going where in the sonic space, the easier it is going to be in the mixing process. Um, if you are, I've mentioned him before, uh, my friend Mark Somerville of The Wave Shop, I put a link in the description to his new website. Uh, if you really want your music to stand out, I, I really suggest you uh, check him out, see if he's uh, right for you. He offers a free mix, um, and that'd be a great way to test out the services. I, I don't like putting things out in public without them being mixed by Mark anymore. Um, that's just, once you've kind of set a standard, <laughs> you don't want to drop below that, and I'm not great on the mixing end. I'd rather just compose and have somebody else worry about the mix. I'm not too picky when it comes to the mix, but Mark does such a great job, you know, and we are kind of, we're kind of in sync and I, I trust his musical opinions and his musical ear, so to speak. So anyways, uh, kind of a short video, I didn't do a lot of musical stuff, but just wanted to talk about uh, these concepts. Hopefully I'll be doing some more videos in the near future. Got a lot of great projects coming up soon that I can't wait to share with you. Uh, I don't always have permissions. I'm sure you all know how that goes. Um, you know, publishing rights and non-disclosure and whatnot. So as those become available, I will let you all know. I uh, appreciate it if you follow me on my Facebook, if you'd like to stay updated on, on things. Andrew Gerlicker Music is my uh, Facebook page, so to speak. Uh, hit me up on there if you have any questions. You can always email me, uh, check out my website. Uh, all that stuff is out there on the web, so appreciate it. Thanks for stopping by, and happy composing.